of technology and social change uh, to build upon. And so I've done a lot of thinking about this question myself, uh, mostly last year, because I was an activist for a while. I'm not, I'm not a hacker. Uh, hello. Um, so I'm not a hacker. I'm sort of more of a hacker of the political system. I've worked on lots of uh, campaigns, written legislation, uh, done campaigns at the local level, cities, states, federal level. And what I realized through all of that is that when you work on political change, it's kind of like working on building software on a bad, outdated operating system. Um, so I made that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so when I say operating system, of course I mean our, our democracy, but I don't mean the concept of democracy. The concept of democracy is great. Right? The concept of democracy means uh, everybody has a say on, uh, in the policies that govern us. Um, but what I'm talking about is the mechanisms uh, of our democracy, and basically we have two mechanisms available to us today that we have had available to, to us for the past few, se few centuries. Um, and those are direct democracy and representative democracy. Um, and we could talk for a while about all the problems with those systems, but uh, in a nutshell, the problem of direct democracy is that you, it's simply unreasonable to think that every person can be an expert on everything. Uh, particularly as the world has grown so big and so complex, um, we all sort of by default need to be specialists in the amount of information that we take in and what, what we pay attention to and what our passions are. Um, and so that's the problem with direct, direct democracy. The problem with representative democracy is, is essentially the same. You're, you're just kind of displacing that same problem of limited bandwidth onto one person, uh, in this case, you know, Nancy Pelosi. And now she, as one human being with 24 hours in a day, needs to make decisions on every issue of which she's not an expert. Um, and so the concept behind dynamic democracy is pretty simple, um, but it's, uh, it wasn't possible centuries ago. It is possible now because it takes a bit of technology to make it happen. And the concept is this. Um, it's like direct democracy in that I have a vote on everything. Um, but at any time, I can choose to give that to, to give my votes away to people that I trust on specific areas of expertise. Um, so, for example, uh, if you and I are talking, we're sitting down for dinner and talking about the environment, and I find that you know you and I have uh, a shared values on that, but you are an expert on it. I could give my vote to you, and every time that you vote on something having to do with the environment, you have two votes instead of one. Um, and so if you can kind of extrapolate that out, uh, you essentially have peer-to-peer -peer representation. Note there aren't career politicians. You essentially just have people who have interests and expertise, and if people trust them on those interests and expertise, um, then they have more power within, the, within that area. Um, and so that's, that's the basic concept behind dynamic democracy. Um, this isn't my original idea. It's been around for a while. Um, but what I brought to it is, is kind of a unique background of doing student organizing. Um, and I've done a lot of uh, work on um, campus environments, working with uh, student, govern student governments to change policy. And what I realized is that, well, there are representative democracy systems all over the world on college campuses that we could replace with this system and that we could try this out in a environment where you have lots of early adopter, young, savvy, uh, forward-thinking people who haven't been uh, disenfranchised or disillusioned with the current process. Um, and so if we can build this system, if we can build a prototype and launch it, and also make it open source so that people can tinker with it, then this sort of pie-in-the-sky idea that seems really good on paper could actually be tested in the real world, and we could get some real data and see if it, see if it works. Um, and so that, that's part of the plan. Um, there's kind of, kind of a lot more to the plan, but I do want to keep this to the five minutes. Um, so I'm kind of rushing through this. But, um, but basically right now we've set, we've set up a nonprofit organization. Um, we are looking for technologists to build some of the early prototypes. And we're also recognizing that this is kind of a long-term strategy as well. Obviously we're not going to change the Constitution overnight. And so what we want to do is also help invest in startups that are working on this larger problem of helping uh, large groups of people make decisions together. Um, and we do think that this kind of proxying 
of votes by domain not, not only could work well in a governing system, but also in businesses and uh, with shareholders, with uh, lots of different um, uh, environments. So that's kind of the basic idea, um, and I'd love to hear questions or ideas or, yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, should we introduce ourselves or something? Or, sure. Okay, my name is Neil. Uh, I work for the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, Wikipedia down the street. Awesome. Um, so, uh, I've been really interested in this idea for a long time myself, like the exact same idea. As, as you said, you're not the first person who's even had the idea, it's been called different things, right. like liquid democracy and right. other even worse names. <laughs> so, um, like liquid democracy, it doesn't sound stable enough, that does it. <laughs> so, right. so, I think the spin, I think you're putting it on that's different, um, is you're trying to say, I trust you on environment issues, but I don't trust you on labor issues, like that kind of thing. So, but how does that work ultimately? Because that means there's proposals somewhere that are tagged as being about environment or about labor. What if they're about both? <laughs> exactly. So that, um, that's one of about 36 issues that we've come up with <laughs> <laughs> that need to be worked out. Um, and that's but, kind of the but taxonomy. You, but, you felt the, issue, right? but you felt the, the tagging of my support is important somehow. Yes. Um, I, I, I think that um, a, a big part of that, you know, many people have talked about this proxying of, vote, of votes, me being able to give you my votes on everything. But I think what's really key about this is being able to break it down and, like you said, give your vote to somebody on what you trust them on. Because it takes into account speci specialization. And, you know, what's lacking from our politics today is basically specialization and decentralization. And both of those things are the cornerstones of effective networks. You know, the, the internet, for example, you don't have every server doing the same thing, but you also don't ensure, yeah, I mean, you ensure that if you shut down one server, it doesn't kill the whole thing. And right now, that's, pro that's the problem with politics, is that it's too centralized. Um, so corruption happens, you know, in Washington, D.C., and we don't get to really deal with it until four years later, and then we elect somebody who's, you know, just as corrupt. Um, whereas with this, you know, there's an immediate almost um, uh, kind of immune system against corruption in that way because of the, but getting back to the specialization part, um, the reason why corruption happens, I feel, in, in my experience, um, is that many people get involved in politi politics because they care about one or two issues. You know, if I run for office, maybe I care about the environment and about civil rights. And then I need to, because I'm uh, also representing people on all of these other issues, I need to trade votes on those issues to get the traction that I need for the issues that I, that I care about. And so this system would prevent against that um, because I would only be focusing on the issues that I care about. And then if I do get bought out and I do get corrupted and the people who, are, who I'm representing find out about that, well, their vote can change immediately and I get ousted from my social circle. Uh, which, which is a, a really good way of, of reinforcing honesty in the system. So, I think that, um, to, to answer the question, it's kind of the way I look at it is more like a, a Twitter meets Quora meets democracy, <laughs> where basically you, you, you start following the people who represent yourself, but you start following mm -hmm. them slash topic. Like like you can do on Cora. So if you if you open Cora and here you can you have topic like uh, actually even democracy actually. You know? Oh um, yeah, well I get it, but I'm just saying like the real world is so not divided into a new tax. Right, right, totally, totally. And, and who decides when a new t when a new topic is or when a topic needs to be divided? And I think you I think that's one of the main points that you brought up. In so if I can address this issue. Um, <coughs> I think people are right to point out that uh, taxonomies are political. Um, even Linnaeus's system for dividing up species, we could talk about the specific history of that. And uh, you know, it reflects the cultural prejudices of its time, um, which ultimately is political for another time, right? So I think this is the type of problem in um, democratic systems for which the separation of powers is helpful. Um, and Micah, I'm wondering if you've thought about that. Um, Mm -hmm. how you would set up um, the kind of bicameralism or um, how, how you would see that separation happening so that the people creating the taxonomy um, hopefully have the right interests. Right. So um, I, I may seem to be sort of sidestepping this, but I'm not. Um, and, and 
the thing is, like I said, this is one of you know many, many issues that I've talked with lots of people about this and lots of issues come up. And that's why um, I initially thought of starting this as kind of a tech startup where you know I just find a tech co-founder, let's build the product and then launch it, launch it and see what happens. But I, what I realized is that we do need a nonprofit that's a bit of a think tank kind of to to have discussions about these long-term implications and uh, start coming up with scenarios of how we might deal with problems like this. Um, so that's part of, part of what we're doing. Basically, there's kind of three pillars to the organization. One is a think tank that goes into many of these issues and looks at different solutions for them. Uh, two is kind of a movement building uh, organization where we you know, take what I'm saying and put it into a short, concise animation video type thing, get it out there and get people beyond uh, behind this idea, um, so it's more of a movement than just us talking about it. And then third is actually creating the technology, and, and we'll do a, mi a mix of kind of creating some proof of concept stuff in-house, but also, like I said, uh, incentivizing entrepreneurs to do a lot of the work um, themselves. Uh, so we're, we're kind of envisioning it like the XPRIZE, um, the XPRIZE for democracy. So the first startup who can replace a student government with a uh, System that had you know that fulfills X, Y, and Z requirements gets a million dollars or something. So um, yeah, that's awesome. That's a great idea. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So this idea of like creating the momentum uh, and the movement behind it. One of the things that I, if I I'm not sure if I'm right on this, but my perception is that like instant runoff voting, ranked choice voting, that stuff is kind of stymied a bit by the power of the political parties mm -hmm. because they're going to get displaced a bit. And I wonder what the role of a political party is in this. Is this something that just subverts them and makes them disappear, or are they like the ultimate people who everyone's following? And you, know? right? Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely that's a question for the think tank. And I've done some thinking on this. Uh, I mean, the way I would envision it is basically kind of ad hoc ad hoc parties that come together on uh, positions on various issues. You know, that kind of come together and then disband when needed. And um, you know, I've gone to a lot of political conferences on the issue that I care about. The, the issue that I've done a lot of work on is drug policy reform. So we have you know, big criminal justice policy, drug policy conferences. And you have a bunch of people sitting around whining about the issue that they care about and then trying to think about how to influence somebody who actually doesn't care about the issue. And what I envision is a future of conferences <laughs> where you go and it's an ad hoc legislative session right there because everybody who shows up has thousands of votes delegated to them, and you sit down and, and you write it, and it looks actually a lot more like an entrepreneurial con conference where you can sit down and have an idea and, you know, go from idea to reality in a week rather than this slow, sluggish process of the political process that we have today. So you have, you have quorum on that issue. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and just like on, like, if you can imagine, like, being able to hit the front page of DIG immediately because you already have thousands of votes, right? So, um, isn't it like a, I'm trying to think like, you know, it's, it's a big, big project. Yeah. And how can we break it down into smaller pieces? Um, and uh, will be one of those pieces being kind of the cloud, the democratic cloud? Like, yeah, yeah, totally. You know, like, how much cloud do you have? And then we do a conference about. I don't know, whatever issue, and then we take all the people who get that issue, we have a cloud for that exactly. issue. Of yeah, one thing I'd, I'd love to see is actually is like metrics on how well of, of a job you're doing as a representative. Um, and this could be something that could be built for the current system and not just for this future system, right? So when I propose a piece of legislation, um, I'm also, what I'm proposing is a set of assumptions about uh, outcomes you know, so if I say, well, let's pass, you know, this piece of legislation, I'm also saying, well, X, Y, and Z will happen. Well, that's clearly measurable, and we can see how right I am, how, you know, what percentage of the time, and so you could have, like, a score of how, how, ma how many of those assumptions are, and, you know, there's that, and um, so, yeah, so what I realized is that, like you said, this is a huge project, there's all these components of it, um, and the more I started looking around, there are all these startups working on kind of unbeknownst to them, working on components of the system. Right. Um, so, for example, you kind of, you know, you need a part of the system that allows you to find the people who would be good to represent you. And there are people um, uh, like Jesse um, and Ben, for example, working on personalized voter guides. 
um, today, which could help you to find people who, you know, who represent you um, or who can give recommendations on um, issues for you. So that kind of thing um, is a startup that we can basically frame as something that could help build this larger thing, and then we can help get that funded um, by putting it in this larger frame. Um, so, yeah. And talking about other so what is that? I just wanted to show it here. Mm -hmm. So is that another one? kind of fun before it reverts your screen. Sorry? Does it ask you? Oops. Ah, like maybe. switch back to resolution. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you see, you're a hacker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So yeah, so 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 where if uh, so for people here, if uh, if they want to do a startup, tackling one of those issues, where they can go to get this million dollar? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, I have I have been talking with people who are interested in funding this. They're really interested in putting money into this because um, a lot of the people that I know who are you know philanthropists who are interested in politics have dumped lots of money down the drain into basically what I call, you know, like building software on a bad operating yeah. system. So they're dumping money into nonprofits who are working to change policy through this failed system. And so it's kind of an easy pitch to say, actually, if you give us money for this, then you're attacking the core problem, which helps all these other issues that you care about. Um, so we're in the process of raising that, but I'm also looking for an executive director who can kind of bring this thing operational. I'm the founder, I'm coming up with the plan and everything, but I'm not like an operations management guy. Um, so I'm looking for somebody with a lot of nonprofit management and fundraising experience. Um, and once we have that, then I think we'll start building the infrastructure for the kind of XPRIZE for democracy thing. We'll also have summits where we can, where start, startups can come out and pitch directly the, the, um, the, the angels that we find and put together in networks. So it's a lot of work to be done, obviously. Um, uh, so yeah. So people can follow you at Midnight Dagger? Yeah, I don't really, I'm not really a tweeter. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can look me up on Facebook. I'm a, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. One other question. Um, uh -huh. It's sort of a disease in the Bay Area of people talking to themselves. You know, we're really technically advanced. Mm -hmm. Hey, one of the great successes of Facebook, Twitter, is it brought non-technical people online. So that's just one non-representative population uh, that are spoken to. My challenge is always, how do you really get a, I mean, not representative, really, representative democracy is neither, um, but more thorough penetration of the population. And I know nothing's perfect. This is one of, I think 36 is modest. You know, there's some really big challenges. A campus would be easier to penetrate the population, but right. this is, um, the communication vehicle is pretty important. Why, why would I give a shit? If I don't use the internet, mm -hmm. which you'd be amazed how many people in America still don't. Yeah. Um, well, who says this is through the internet? Uh, Pardon me for I don't know. Well, I, I would. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, that's, I'm hearing that that's the tool. Yeah, I mean, I think it would it would almost need to be. Um, but that being said, I mean, the, the, kind of two responses to that. One is that, you know, I don't envision mass scale adoption of this anytime soon. And, and what I'm looking at are, you know, two-year-olds growing up with iPads in their hands today. You know, mm -hmm. that, that, that we are, that, that we're bringing up a generation of tech-savvy people. And so if we can put it in a place like college campuses, for, for instance, um, the first democratic system that people are going to use when they're of age is going to be a better democratic system than the rest of the country has. Um, and so they're not going to want to revert back. So it's sort of a long-term strategy of kind of getting, getting young people used to it. Um, and then, you know, mass scale adoption. And then, we, I mean, there's also the gap between people who don't have the money for computers and, you know, we need to ensure that there's a way for them to participate as well. So that's one of the many problems that we need to address for sure. Uh, but I think that those are better problems to address than the current problems that mm -hmm. we have. We may not have colleges in 20 years, though. I, I expect not. Right. So, um, interesting. And there's going to be another debate for another hacking college. That's pretty about, soon. Uh, hacking colleges. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. I just want to point out, I mean, this literally happened on, like, the wiki mailing lists, is that there's people from... Uh, 
places like Egypt who are saying, we want to write a new constitution. We want to do it with wikis. <laughs> and we're like, I don't know, that seems like a really bad idea. <laughs> but, um, something like this where maybe people were voting on the changes that they were doing, uh -huh. um, I, I think actually the future is going to change faster than we expect, especially mm -hmm. in these places like that. that are, the U.S. is going to be the last place to change, I have to say. Mm -hmm. I'm almost certain of that. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, places like... Campus is a great idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. Well, it's, it, it is a good idea. I didn't mean to be discouraged. No, thank, thank you. I appreciate that. And since, since you brought up uh, wikis, just to um, one realization I had recently is that you know this is kind of a lot bigger than just fixing politics. This is kind of a, um, a it, it's an it's a natural evolution of the technolo technological progress. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean if if you look at I mean pretty much Wikipedia was the technology, or wikis were the technology that allowed us to kind of um, exploit the wisdom of the crowds on things that kind of have an objective answer in the world, you know, like, you know, basic knowledge, right? And now there's kind of all this technology coming out that helps exploit the wisdom of the crowd on things that have a more subjective answer, like Quora, right? Um, and then, you know, we have prediction markets that kind of exploit the wisdom of the crowd on things that have an object objective answer in the future. But we don't yet have any technology that's good at exploiting the wisdom of the crowds on what should be in the future, which is basically the subjective, kind of the quora of the future, basically. So, so it's, it's kind of this big niche that's bigger than fixing politics is basically we, we need to be better at working together at figuring out what we should do in the future and that that could be you know six friends deciding you know what apartment to live in together or something you know like it's it's as basic as that I think um, I'm not sure about that I mean that might be a stretch but anyway yeah uh, I was going to say one yes. place mm -hmm. last question okay um, better make it good then. Um, if, no pressure. <laughs> if uh, there's like new legislation in uh, Congress right now that might eventually let us like read the bill for uh, I think it's like 72 hours before they actually vote on it, mm -hmm. I could actually see this sort of thing being uh, really useful in that specific niche. When the bill goes online, you're able to check with the various thought leaders that you follow whether they think an important bill is like really mm -hmm. good or really bad. Um, have, you, have you thought about like how you might want to use this for like uh, legislation that's coming about in the more immediate future? Or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, you know, like I said before, I think that that there's a lot of there are a lot of tools that could make our current democratic system less fucked up. <laughs> you know, um, that could also pave the way for this. And I, I haven't thought too much about that in particular, but yeah, I think that that, that could be cool. So. Yeah, if you want to build it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you very much. As far as something that's, that is more uh, appropriate to the, the current legislative process, there's a book written by a man named Sal, something or other, about something he called Interactive Representation. Um, his organization used to be called Democracy 2000 before. Sort of lost its war factor, <laughs> money change, but um, uh, and he, he wrote a pretty good book uh, about compliance uh, in these countries, uh, yeah. and, and sort of completely eliminating the existing um, uh, when the legislature breaks up into committees, like the whole committee process is completely broken. So basically, he uses something like this type of thinking to to eliminate the committee process in Congress and just have congressmen be able to delegate votes to each other. I need just so, um, huh. so uh, what was the was that? Uh, his name's Saul something or other. I, I can send you uh, I can send you an email, but it's um, in my democracy does democracy, democracy two thousand dot org still forward to it because I want to check it and you can find the new name or this, this, this is a framework for people who are elected in the current system. That's correct. Right. But, it, but, it, but it's still a better framework because you don't, if you're a freshman congressman, now you have as much power as someone who's been in there 20 years under his system. Okay. You understand? So, so it, it's a step along the way. Because, because every, in other words, so all these committees are organized ad hoc by the group, by delegating and re delegating 
the power and the people who have the most delegates to come to the show. Yeah. Okay, so. Many others. Were you at City Council? So we had the pleasure to have the only guy with the meetup t shirt. Brent from Curl Club. So. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you. So, uh, does anyone who like knows what Caramel is? A few people. Okay. Great. So, five-minute version. This is what Caramel looks like. Uh, this is basically a way for people to change businesses. And um, if you sort of think of the traditional way people do that, you think of boycotts and protests and lawsuits and this sort of very conflict-oriented approach. We use. The carrot, not the stick, that's the carrot mob. So, uh, in a carrot mob campaign, businesses compete at how socially responsible they can be, and then the network of consumers spends money to support the winner. So, brief example, the first carrot mob three years ago in the mission, that's me in the suit, went to uh, 23 liquor stores, and I said, I want one of you guys to be the green liquor store. I promise somehow I'll bring hundreds of people to this store. What percentage of the revenue that we would bring on this one day are you willing to set aside and reinvest in energy efficiency? So most were confused, not interested, <laughs> no, really glass, whatever. Uh, but there were several who bid, and this is David Lee. He had the highest bid, 22%. So then uh, I took it to the streets, got some people, and we all showed up, hundreds of people on this one day, and we spent about $9,000 on beer and popsicles and all that stuff. So that was enough for him to, to finance the retrofit of his entire lighting system. So that's the opposite of a boycott. It is a win-win model for activism. Since then, three years ago, we've had a lot of traction. We now have had about 130 campaigns in about 20 countries, mostly focused on climate change, but some social justice campaigns as well. And we have all this traction and press and, and so on. The real reason that we have traction, though, is that we have people now around the world who are, who are you know, seeing the video of, of uh, what we've done here and they're, they're doing this all over the place. So this has kind of turned into this grassroots movement. We haven't had the resources to you know, recruit too many people. It's just kind of this organic excitement of people wanting to get involved. Uh, so this every type of business. This is a uh, hardware store in Minneapolis, an ice cream parlor in Mexico City, uh, grocery store in Chicago, coffee shop here in SF, uh, bubble tea stand, and so on. So this is all really great, and this is what Caramob looks like today. But where we're going is this. And if you think about, uh, there's, there's no reason that we can't apply the same principle to the largest companies in the world. So we want to, I'm building an organization to aggregate you know, tens of millions of people and then use that consumer demand to change the largest companies and do whatever. You can imagine, uh, you know, Halloween in a couple of years, we'll just say, all right, everyone, you know, it's 20 million people, we're all going to buy only Kit Kats for trick-or-treaters if you switch to fair trade, or, or you know, we're going to send, you know, everyone, in every Super Bowl party in 2014 is going to be only, like, drinking Miller Lite, and we want a maternal leave policy, whatever. <laughs> uh, so... There's lots to talk about there, but I want to, and there's just lots more to the idea, of course, but I want to just pivot, that's probably two and a half minutes, so we'll then say, I, there's a lot of different angles here, and I, I kind of set aside just a couple thoughts for the hacking democracy <coughs> angle. Um, so when I think about the implications of this idea in democracy, I think about this notion of voting with your wallet. He wants you to get the slide. What's that? Oh uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> uh, so everyone votes with their wallet when you buy the eco detergent. That's your values in the purchase, that's a vote. I'm going to buy that day in the USA pickup truck. You know, that's a vote. Um, and it's just funny, if, if you think about that, then, then what is in the free market system, is there a democracy there? And like, who, uh, who has power? It's easy for us to say, oh, it's the CEOs, they're running everything. Or, oh, it's the shareholders. Uh, but then a lot of them are saying, oh, it's consumer demand, we just, we just do whatever the consumers want. 
So, you know, on some level, we have all that power. But yet, we don't feel empowered. We don't feel like we're using it. So, <laughs> what is the difference between consumer demand and voting? There's lots of, lots of practical differences. I mean, you, you can only get one vote per person, but in other ways, there's, there's a similarity here. And so I'm interested in the question of what can we do to make consumer demand more like voting and make it have a greater impact. So just to, to just talk about demand for a minute, this is how demand used to be expressed. Consumer says, I'm buying $80 Reebok shoes. Retailer gets that information, passes it along. And then Reebok says, OK, that's what we, with this one data point, that's what we now conclude about consumer demand. They like that shoes, enough to pay 80 bucks. Uh, meanwhile, there's all this other stuff which consumers may be wishing to communicate to a large company. Uh, but you know, they, they're just one person. This is a big company. You can't get through. Uh, if you got feedback, who cares? Uh, now, these days, new kinds of communications are possible. You got feedback and suggestions. Well, Get Satisfaction allows you to aggregate all that feedback in a way that's actually useful to the large company and digestible. Um, so you can make sense of that. Groupon allows you to say, I pay $60 for those Reebok. And then, all right, now that that's presented in a useful way, a valuable way, you get a deal. There's still no way to convey your values to a large company in a way that is digestible and, and useful for them, that shows them the, the ROI of doing social benefit. So, you know, people will say, well, somebody's, oh, people, corporations aren't doing good because no one's demanding it. And my contention is that there are many who are, who are demanding it, who are silently just desperate to see these companies do good, but that demand is invisible. There's like the architecture of the free market system has no way for companies to see it or for us to convey it. So uh, what we want to do is reveal that demand by having it come through us and, and be presented to businesses all at once to say, here it is, here's what your ROI would be. So back to voting with your wallet here, um, you know, if, if, you, if you're, you're an eco detergent, if that's a vote, uh, your vote just sort of floats off. And there's some statistician in some company who's saying, oh, well, I've concluded that it's probably the case that they bought this because of the eco sticker. Or well, maybe it was the general economy picking up. Or maybe it was the shelf space we negotiated at Walmart or whatever. And there's no direct feedback loop there. And so no one's counting your votes, essentially. And, and I'm interested in being the first organization that will count the votes. All right, you're voting all the time. You're making these values-based purchases. Well, Tell us what you're doing, and we're going we're gonna to get results on your behalf. And tell us why you're doing it. Uh, so it's like there's all this voting happening. We're going to be the ballot box. What's the point of voting if there's no uh, election day? <laughs> right? So like, we're going to, oh, well, guess what? The next week's election day. We're going to find out which you know, chocolate company wins. Uh, and we're going to get results. And, and we're going to bring in other NGOs working on other issues to put stuff on the ballot. And so. That's kind of, uh, that's kind of the, the main sort of points I wanted to, to, to bring out here. Um, I also think that it's interesting in sort of the era of Citizens United to think about like our democracy, like so much of the dysfunctional stuff that's happening is kind of because there's this, you know, all these companies are sort of the puppet master like above the system and I see it, some sort of opportunity here to have us then become kind of the puppet masters above the companies who are already, you know, <laughs> trickle down puppetry or something. Uh, so, that is the five minute food for thought. Questions? Yeah. Um, so, my question still is primarily that, yeah, this, there's a certain segment of companies that are going to participate in this um, that are going to want to get more business by becoming more ecological because they've done it cost-benefit analysis, and yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, but what does that do for everybody else? Everybody else who is just like, you know, we're not playing the game, and uh, so you, uh, you know, it still kind of keeps, still seems to me that in, how do you get the penetration throughout the, mm -hmm. the whole uh, corporate environment? I think you, we can't. I think there's limits to this. I think that where this is going to work is... See, there's some businesses, 
care about the cash that they're going to get, and some businesses think more about the reputation capital, the, the brand value. Uh, I think it's a very valuable project, but, it, but okay. Sure. So like liquor stores are like cash in the door. Coffee shops are like reputation. The gap would be like, ooh, reputation. Uh, I don't know if on that scale, if, if anyone's really going to be thinking about the cash, I kind of think it's more going to be a brand play, which means that if we wanted to go to Alcoa, who does like aluminum, like, we probably can't. Unless we find a way to, to you know, care about Coca-Cola, who then we're asking them like force Alcoa to, to like do their thing in the cans. So there may be other levers, and there may be so, so like B2B care mobs, like we could say. Hmm. Uh, B2B care mobs. Right? Yeah, and, and I've thought of like, uh, for example, you know, I just see like the Greenpeace is attacking Facebook for its data centers. It's kind of like, what if you got all these tech companies to say like, we're all going to like support some really like company that creates a data center that's just cutting edge. and. And so you could think of um, you could think of a bunch of companies also saying we're all going to buy the industrial hand soap, you know, whichever industrial hand soap for all of our corporate canvases. So there's certain ways that could uh, that could be played. But I, I agree that there's limits. I mean, I, I have a solution, a long-term solution for you. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there a cliff notes you want to share? Well, it's just a, well, it's 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 like I said, it's kind of the reverse. I mean, I do think ultimately you have to go back to punishing companies for bad behavior. But you can make it totally subjective like this. Yeah. I think that we need to do a subjective externalities market, and we need to actually uh, make it legally binding, where we basically redistribute the tax liabilities of companies directly, um, and we say, okay, this is a this is what this municipality needs to make it to no longer charges uh, property tax to companies. Instead, that whole liability is pooled, and then the voters go, they take their section and say, you know, I think. Say it's a thousand dollars per voter, and then fifty people vote against McDonald's, and McDonald's gets fifty thousand dollars tax. So. Well, why do why do it from the top down instead yeah. of from the bottom up? I mean, you brought up the back to your uh, first example with the twenty three liquor stores. Why not say, all right, well, the top guy is going to get all of our business for the day, but the bottom guy is going to get no one's business for a week. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, uh, there's, there's just some serious like First Amendment issues with what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, right. Exactly. You're basically saying you, you're going to tax some business out of existence that is supposedly right to exist. <laughs> yeah, I think so, any, any any situation well, where tax is involved is is the carrot or the stick is probably not the best one. Um, so well, I to, have I have transition models. It's once again just the okay. ultimate model that I was talking about with him. So I guess there are two trends that we might want to identify that are pretty relevant um, to this metaphor between uh, consumer spending and voting. And um, one of the trends is that the Supreme Court is making voting more like consumer spending, which is being seen as a form of free speech. Um, now, obviously, we know that consumer spending is not free speech. Um, two reasons would be monopoly and addictions, right? We can think of lots of examples of both. Right. Um, we try, different countries try to make voting um, more like free speech rather than consumer spending by regulating when and how you can have political ads. And this is why you'll have, for instance, in England, two weeks before you actually vote, when you don't have advertisements. I think it's called a reflection period, something like that. Um, and the notion is to create more um, basically disinterested um, rational folks. You know? But what really interests me about this project is, um, is the incentive structure. Um, and I'm really curious how many. Um, how many sort of instigators were, were there for the 130 mm. um, mobs? I'm sure you did a bunch of them yourself. Uh, okay, I, I kind of want to say a couple quick things. So one oh, sure. thing, uh, to Steve, to your point, is um, that... Wait, 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 Oh, wait, nah, I, mean, I got confused on what I was going to say. I was going to say about you, uh, your point, that the idea that having the, punishing the bottom person is, um, it basically, I think maybe combined, I want to say, I believe in the carrot and the stick combined. That's right. the best way to move the donkey. Right, I so, agree. And I, I think I agree that with the primacy of political solutions, like if they exist, and we can just say, all right, this is the law, you have to do this, whether, I mean, not addressing whether it's a tax thing or not, that I, I still think that is, that is the goal. Um, and I see this as sort of like a filling in the, the gap while that system fails. Um, 
And then on the negativity, basically I think our, we're best positioned to be always seen by the brands as like a really safe, like Halliburton's like, come, come, come talk to us, like we're, we, oh, we're only Carrot, and you know, yeah we got friends who are going to like stick you, but um, so that, that's kind of my, my uh, attitude on, on that thought. Yeah. And then regarding what you're asking about, um, I've only done two. Uh, this is done, I mean, so there's been several repeat organizers, you know, in Minneapolis, Victoria, Canada, Singapore, there's sort of like certain people, but largely we see a lot of college uh, activity at colleges, um, or like the Net Impact Club and stuff like that. I don't know, there's nothing, but it's really, I've seen this happen in like every different sort of, you know, red states, blue states, like some with like older people, although they're not as wired, so they don't like know about it as much, so. We also have a, a middle school in El Cerrito has a uh, elective course called Carrot Mob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they do like pizza parlor and so it's, we're kind of all over the place. So what motivates them? I guess that is. Sort mm. of a, is there any common? The count. Well, uh, so I think uh, I think that there's. I just want to say there's a caveat that some people are just like this is the coolest thing. I want to be the first in my town. Some people are just like curious about it. Uh, and excited, but what I think we're doing is lowering the barrier to entry to, to activism in general because we're saying, uh, you know, traditional activism, you're probably doing something that's seen as radical or it's seen as un-American or it's controversial or it's negative or it takes a lot of time or it takes a lot of money, I mean, we're none of those things. We are, like your grandma would be like, oh, I, support, I would buy a loaf of bread to support that cause, everybody's happy, like, you know, it's, it's a win-win sort of model, so I, I think that, that, you know, everyone has a little activist in them, and I think that when we see most activism opportunities, they come with a little bit of, like, you, like, have to be sort of ready to, like, piss someone off to, like, participate, or, like, really, really, really be passionate to, like, go out there and, like, chant in the sun for, a, you know, so this is something where it's, like, there's a broad spectrum of engagement. You can just do something very little up to organizing, and you're not really like making enemies. So I think psychologically, it's maybe a little easier. Uh, sure. Um, so first of all, this is amazing. Um, light bulbs going off like crazy. You've probably thought of this, but it's a new thought for me. Um, the Groupon um, model, um, and particularly with national brands, to be able to create a deal with them saying, hey, if we get X amount of people to buy X amount of your of your product or X amount of like prepaid coupons or something like that for your for your business, will you make some big effect? And that the the whole hype over the Groupon model and all the clones that are out there right now where people are trying to get good deals. What about instead of getting a good deal, the good deal they get is a better doing something. You know, thing which I think you point out on your on your thing, but I'm thinking more from a, a system <coughs> systematic framework of actually having the Groupon like mm -hmm. software uh, ready to go um, and being able to do it on such a mass scale that would be, imagine it would be the big problem, right? You have to have it be on a mass enough scale because it's not good enough to sell fifty thousand dollars worth of Coca Cola in order right. to get Coca Cola to do something. You need to sell five million right. to to make it hit that. Yeah, right. I totally agree, yeah. and that is exactly what we're going to do. Yeah, great. Right. Uh, and there, there's different ways that we can go about tracking the spending, and, and you know, you could do a mobile payment app or a Caremont debit card. There's lots of options that we're looking at, and one of them is definitely the voucher Groupon style yeah. system. But it can't work unless, until, you, you don't want to send people there before it happens, right? You have to reach a certain threshold before yes. it to happen, so, but people will have already bought the thing. So it's like this whole thing where, like, if you get everybody in on it at once, then after they've made those commitments, then you have a lot of clout with, with Pepsi or whatever, but yeah. then if they don't do the thing, then everybody's dollar disappears. Well, what we right? can do you is, know, like, it's the same thing where, you know, in the Groupon model, they have a threshold, and they say, yeah. all right, say you're going to buy, and we're not actually charging your right. credit card until, until, right. until we are spending $10 million in Coca-Cola. Right, so, okay. So, yeah, I think we'll, we'll need to pursue the same thing. What does it take today, if I want to create a carrot mob, what does it... What do I need to do? Is there a website well, or guidelines to follow? The best thing with? for you personally to do would be quit your job at Storify and join <laughs> as a software. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, 
So we have we have a, a, a website, carrotmonth.org, and it's a real site which is totally busted and unfinished. And I would advise you to just create a Facebook event for now until uh, a couple months from now. We're gonna we're, we're so we're one of the things we're doing is raising money right now, and we're about to be. I've got two meetings tomorrow with software engineers. You know, we're trying to find the right our team. So, uh, um, so that. There's sort of a long vision of what we're, we're going to have, and right now you can join, you can join our website, get on the mailing list. You won't be impressed with your experience in the, today. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, at Caramob, slash Caramob. Uh, but I can tell you more about like where we're headed. Um, if you want, in brief, like, I actually really keep, the core comparison keeps coming up, because I think it's brilliant. And one of the things about Caramon, there's so many different types of content you might want to know about. There's your social graph, what are your friends participating in, there's your location, what's my community doing, there's topics. Uh, so you should, we were, we're basically building a, a model where you can say, I live here, these are the issues I care about, you know, send me an email or a text when there's anything within either like Miami or San Francisco, and I only want to care about animal rights, I don't care about environmental campaigns. Um, but we're not there yet. What is yes, the next question? Cool. Do you have any business or marketing executives on your advisor as advisors? Uh, yes. So there's only two of us full time right now, myself mm -hmm. and, and Sarah. Uh, there's a lot of advisors. I mean, I just I feel like yeah, there's a long list of advisors. Tamson Smith, who started uh, Product Red at Gap. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's various people. Uh, but that's going to be a key, a key hire. I think someone who not only can market us to the mainstream, but someone who is able to understand how the marketing person mm -hmm. in the CBG big brand is going to mm -hmm. think about this. Mm -hmm. There was one last question. Yeah. Well, yeah, it sounded like uh, using Kickstart would be another way to, um, to marshal a critical mass. Mm -hmm. If you approach the companies up front and say, if we can raise the critical mass, would you do a particular thing and then you could just put that on Kickstarter? That'd be pretty like wait. Yeah, I mean that I think the the principle of what they're doing is exactly right. We wouldn't actually use Kickstarter themselves because we want I mean we want our own system for that and they also have right. but, restricted. But we wanted to do something today. Yeah. 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 Same mm -hmm. idea. Thank you. Yeah. Carol Mark to find the best place to host this Hack Democracy event. And uh, this is uh, very soon, so I wanted to uh, actually uh, invite them to uh, tell a few words about this space. Yeah. It can be your first yeah, yeah. to host us tonight. So yeah. thank you very much. For your time. Great turnout. Um, so my name is Anne. I run the space here with a couple other people. We just moved here about six weeks ago. So part of the year is some work we take and stuff around. We're still painting. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Parasoma is a co-working and event space. So by day we're actually a shared office. We have a bunch of different startups and freelancers and entrepreneurs and independent workers and uh, an interior designer and all sorts of different people who um, are looking for the community that comes with an office without the, you know, office part that sucks. I don't know how to explain that. But, you know, the part that one likes. No cubicles, we don't do any of that. We've got memberships starting at $100 per month. Um, it's 275 for 24-7 access, and you know we go up from there. We've got some private offices open too. Um, we do free drop-ins, so if you guys want to come check it out, uh, you should do that. Um, and also we have some meetups and whatnot. So if you have any questions about anything, you guys can come find me when you're done here. And I'd love to talk to you. I'll be on the couch. <laughs> and they do uh, a ping pong competition in two weeks. Yeah, we have a ping pong tournament next Saturday. It's gonna be great. Um, <laughs> I'm really bad at ping pong, but apparently we've got some like pretty good players who are coming. So um, check out our website, uh, come to other events. We, the computer right out here on the other side of this wall has our newsletter sign up. So if you're interested mm -hmm. in learning more about events we do here, we do usually a couple a week, um, ranging from ping pong tournaments to the tan tournament, um, stuff like this. We're doing a big mobile mixer uh, demo night next week. Um, so. Runs again. So. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for, for coming, and uh, so you probably already are uh, on the website, Hack Democracy, so if you have also ideas for the next next month meetup, you know, mm -hmm. if you have projects that you are working on that you would love to present, 
going to take. Uh, they have beers over there, I've been told, with the donation box, uh, because this is provided by the space. Um, yeah, and thanks for organizing. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>